je svakako prekida. You can always cut it later. Yes. Hi everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hi everyone. Good afternoon from Vienna. Uh, welcome to my YouTube channel, Making It in Austria. Today I have a great pleasure to introduce you my former MBA colleague, Omar Veledar. Omar, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. As you can see, uh, we are very, very happy to see each other, at least uh, online, virtually nowadays. Omar, like with all of my guests, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself a little bit to our audience and then we take it from there. Uh, it's a complex story, so I'm going to have to try to keep it short, I suppose. So uh, originally we came from the same country, whatever it's called nowadays, so next Yugoslavia. Um, um, I left quite early. I was 18 years old when I left. I went to England. I studied there. I spent quite a few years there studying and then working. And then about 10 years ago, I came to Austria. Originally, I trained as electronic engineer. Then I moved slightly into science, physics. I worked as academic for a few years as a researcher. And then I came to Austria to do a little bit more what academics call real life work. So I have worked in industry for the last 10 years. Mm. So you spent the last 10 years in, in Austria with your family? Mm. As the German would say, yes, uh, I spent 10 years in Austria, but the family came in within those 10 years. Within those 10 years. The, fa the family was created in the meantime. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit what you do? So a little bit about your work. I do the perfect, the most perfect job on the planet, which is the one you can't define. So the, the more vague your job is, the better it is for me, because then it's more interesting. Um, so officially, uh, I am some form of innovation manager and project manager, uh, or R&D project manager, which is slightly more specific. So um, uh, it's kind of part of, let's call it open innovation. So. I um, set up different projects with external partners. Uh, we set up consortiums, sometimes we search for funding, we decide what to do basically on a technical level, we decide how this fits to the outside world, how you can align it to the internal strategic processes strate or internal strategy, business strategy, and then how to exploit it. And of course, in that kind of situation, you have to take care of, of the externals as well as of your own organization. So from my perspective, it's about creating that kind of project and making sure that it runs properly. Um, at the same time, the other part of the job is to try to align it within, within my internal organization. Mm -hmm. And then the third part of the project is basically to make sure that, 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 that your external partners are also happy because you want to make sure that everybody's happy because then you have the next project after the previous one. So it's it's a kind of I belong to the organization I belong to. That's where I do my core core part of the work. But at the same time, with each project, you kind of become a part of the project. So we really treat projects in a, in a classic sense as temporary organizations or something like that. And that's kind of a big part of my work and then with that there's all sorts of different things so there's a kind of exposure to the external world so it's a kind of presenting things i wouldn't call it marketing because marketers would laugh at me but yeah kind of marketing your work um and writing papers conferences mm. making sure that you, you you bring new contacts a little bit of technology scouting all sorts of different things so the interesting part is that it's not well defined so mm. you define it as you go along and every, 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 every project is different. As you're talking, um, I'm just thinking of different professors that we had uh, during our MBA. It's just different sentences are coming to my mind. So that's why I was um, silently la laughing, like marketing is everything or yeah. the okay. other one. <laughs> There's, the main sentence from MBA is marketing is everything. And I totally... <laughs> I totally believe in it. I don't necessarily comply with it, but I believe in it. And the other one, since you were mentioning about the, talking about the projects and being successful, uh, once uh, I forgot the name of the professor, but it was about meeting the expectation or exceeding the expectation. Um, and he was saying that companies tell, yeah, we want to exceed customer expectations. And he was from the operational management. 
and mm-hmm. he was saying, can you please at least meet the customer expectations and then we can talk about, you know, exceeding uh, the expectations. That would be Bob, I suppose, yes. that's the prof. Um, yeah, from my perspective, it's a little bit different because I have to think about customers, not current customers, not even that, you know, the, the short term, but I have to think about future trends. So my work is, is research mm. based or oh. I officially, I don't do the, 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 the technical work anymore as such. I used to do it up to, I stopped three years ago. Now it's more kind of really on, on, the, on the management side of things. Um, so I have to think about what happens in, in five, 10 years time. Um, mm. So it's not only meeting expectations of the customers now, but trying to predict what it is that they will want trying to predict what it is that they don't know yet that they will want sometimes in the future and then work in that direction so that when they actually figure out what it is that they, they might require, and when they come back to you and say, look, can we talk about it, that you already have at least rough idea of what it is that you want to do. You might not necessarily have a solution. It would be great if you already had a solution, but that's not going to happen most of the times. But you should have at least some rough idea of what it is that you want to do and how you can collaborate. So. Mm. It's, it's not meeting expectations, it's not exceeding it, it's trying to predict what they might be in the future and then trying to get, get the ground ready for, for, for this kind of work. Thank you, Omar, for this um, point. But coming back to the Making It in Austria community, um, um, I would like to ask you about how was your move from England, you said, to Austria? So was it a sl- easy move? Or was it something that you have been some challenges that you have been conf- confronted with in the mean, in the meantime? Something that you would like to share from that experience? Um, I suppose in my case, the first move, the first, I mean, even before I was eighteen, I, I moved around a lot. Um, um, I was brought up in four different places, kind of. They're not far away from each other, but you know, far enough culturally. Let's put it that way. Um, so the, the move to England was quite, um, quite a, let's call it, it's not a shock, but it was definitely a kind of surprise because the differences are huge in terms mm. of culture and expectations. So that was definitely, especially at that age, um, that was kind of a change. However, if you do it once, and then I've done it again, because then later on, I, I lived in Germany for a year as well. Uh, you just get used to it. And even within England itself, you have several cultures within a culture. I mean, England mm-hmm. is quite diverse, diverse society. So you just simply get used to it. And it also depend, It also comes from my background. I mean, within my family, we are quite diverse anyway, background-wise. And so for me, it's normal. Um, and if you've done it enough times in the past, then it, every change is, is, is easier. Um, mm-hmm. Coming to Austria, it's a totally different world, let's put it this way. Um, England is a lot more liberal, a lot more open, a lot more communicative. Um, so um, it was a change, but it was not such a difficult one. I think the, the biggest issue for me was kind of work-wise. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> it's not as open as England is. So you have to adapt yourself to that. And the question is how much you are prepared to adapt yourself. So basically, wherever you go, it doesn't matter. And that's, that's valid for every country. Um, you have to offer some kind of flexibility because you have to adapt yourself to the country you, you are in. Otherwise, what's the point? Uh, and if you don't like it, you can just leave and try to find somewhere else where it suits you. Uh, so you have to change a little bit. Um, at the same time, it's also a question how much, how flexible you should be. And because if you're totally flexible, you, use, you lose who you are. So um, for me, it was okay because um, I suppose Austria is a lot closer to where I come from or where we come from. Mm-hmm. Um, so going from England to Austria was kind of halfway or more than halfway to going back home. So it wasn't that difficult for me however had I come here have I, had I arrived here when I was 18 then that change would have been a lot bigger mm. um, but because I was already somewhere else it wasn't that of a, of a shock to me 
Did you already have a job when you moved to Austria? That was the only reason why I moved, basically. Well, no, sorry, that that was the not the only reason. That was that was, the reason was basically I needed to be closer to to to, to my family. But mm -hmm. um, I looked for work. Then I moved. I wouldn't have come here had I not find the the job I was interested. In. Mm -hmm. And how important is that uh, the German language? Because that's the question I usually very often get <laughs> from people. Yeah, I would like to come to Austria, but I don't speak the German language. Can I find a job? Is it possible? In my case, it's totally irrelevant. Um, if you, so I, I live in Graz. Uh, I work in a company where in Graz there's four and a half thousand people in a company. Uh, there's about 11,000 worldwide. Uh, about, I can't remember exact number, but something like 70% of the workforce are engineers and scientists. Mm -hmm. So if you wish to find that many good quality engineers in a city that size of grads, you're going to struggle. So clearly there is a lots of, there are lots of foreigners in the company. Um, and not everybody speaks German. That's one thing. The second thing is, uh, there is a very, I work in automotive industry and if you will live in the automotive world, yes, of course, there are lots of other companies in, in, in German speaking world, which are and, or probably the strongest ones are in the German speaking world, world, but you can't simply work with them only. So you have to work with lots of different around the world. If your customers don't speak English, then uh, sorry, mm -hmm. don't speak German, then doesn't make any difference. Then simply most of my work is in English. I had, I had, I changed position within a company three times. So I'm in a fourth position within the same company. And one of those positions was where I had to work a lot with manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And yes, I have learned all sorts of different names for different tools and screws and all sorts of connectors. I learned the German words that, that, that generally German, German speaking people would not know. Uh, but these are not very useful in your everyday life. Um, but Generally speaking, more than 90% of my work is in English anyway. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was not a stumbling block. If you go outside, you know, being able to communicate is what's, what's important, not necessarily to be able to express yourself in most complicated, sophisticated, whatever way. Um, so I can communicate in German. I still don't speak German. I probably never will learn German well enough to be able to speak it properly, but I can communicate in German. Um, it's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been better to, to, to be able to speak it properly. I have to say it's, it's a kind of sad fact that I don't speak it properly. But yeah, there are always other priorities. I have done so many things in the last 10 years that and German has never been priority for me. Mm. Um, maybe it will change in the future. Maybe when I retire, I'll sit down and I'll have time to, to learn German. And privately, Omar? Then you know you have family, you have kids. Uh, you speak then German. No, we speak no. English at home. Uh, it's a bit complex. That's a complex issue because because my kids are basically trilingual. Uh, so living away for so long, so many years, English is English is the easiest language for me to converse in. So I talk to kids in English, and mm -hmm. uh, my wife talks to them in our language, and I and then they speak German in a in the outside world mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah that's probably also a big part of the reason why we don't why I have not uh, been so good in, in German just just one mm -hmm. second sorry my apologies I forgot to turn the heating up a little bit earlier so the room is getting a bit cold <laughs> and it's winter yeah uh, Omar, how about uh, people who are thinking now, so um, who are listening to this, uh, so they're sitting somewhere in Europe or somewhere outside in, in the world and they're thinking to move to, to Austria. What would you recommend them? So what should they do or could do before they come here and, and confront with the cultural um, differences, language, paperwork, administration, all of that? Uh, I suppose in most of the cases, um, uh, moving pretty much to any country, I could give always the same advice, pretty much be flexible and be open to, to, to what is there, because whatever, wherever you go to, 
um, whatever your expectation is, unless you've already been to the country many times, I can guarantee you that your expectation is wrong. Um, I mean, my expectations of England, for example, are totally different from what 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 my findings were. Um, I've been either through work or privately. I have visited so many countries, and even just visiting as a tourist or visiting it for work for maybe a month. Um, before you get there, you of, of course you have some expectation when you visit there you have uh, uh, some findings which are totally different from your expectations. And then those are again, totally different from the same findings that you would have if you actually go to live there. Mm. So for example, um, going to England was definitely, I mean, within Europe, it's probably totally different from, from majority of Europe. Um, and I always thought that I would never have experience to to feel that that kind of change in my life if I ever moved to any kind of other what 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 people often would call I don't know Western society if you would mm -hmm. like to call it that way. And then I went to Japan with work, and then it's just total shock. Uh, basically, everything is done completely different way and whatever you try to do you just try to minimize the the, the amount of, of offense you're going to create because they do everything in a totally different way and you know that just by being yourself just by sitting there and breathing in and out you're probably offending somebody because you're doing something totally different way um, and um, every country is specific <clears throat> but you have to go with an open mind um, and and you have to, as I said earlier, you simply have to be flexible to adapt. And at the same time, you have to define what that flexibility, where that flexibility ends. Because for example, when I went to Japan, um, my experience was very different from my colleagues who were living there for a year, maybe, who were also yeah. Europeans who were working on the same project. Um, so you have kind of these three levels. You have one expectation that you have without ever visiting or maybe being there just as a tourist for a couple of days. Then you have a different kind of view of the situation if you stay there for maybe a bit longer, for a month or two. And then you have totally different view if, if you actually have to live there. Mm -hmm. And you know, going and paying for a bill or making a contract for your mobile phone or whatever, that that if you come as a tourist or somebody who stays for a shorter time, you have you don't have to go through that. Yeah. So um, in terms of, and this is that general wherever you go. Um, so what is specific to Austria is uh, Austrians are very kind of structured. Um, so generally speaking, you know what needs to be done in order for next step to be to happen. Um, in England, you, this is a lot more kind of fluid, open. Uh, you make it up as you go along, you, you bend the rules a little bit, everybody's bending the rules a little bit and it kind of everything fits because everybody bends a little bit in one direction or another, somehow you find some perfect fit. Uh, in Austria, it's a little bit more structured. Mm. Um, Greetings to our English friends. Yeah. Oh. So anybody who comes, who comes here, they have to be used, they have to be prepared to go through a structure and traditional way of looking at things sometimes. <laughs> Um, Omar, another point as well is, um, you know, you work a lot and you have family and uh, friends. So, um, how important is uh, this networking or communities? How important are they at, maybe at the beginning or as you go along the way? So how do you spend your time, you know, when you're not working? Um, I mean, generally speaking, networking is good. Oh, it's not just good, but I mean, it's definitely beneficial and it's definitely needed, uh, be it, be it work-wise or privately. Um, it opens your horizons. Um, it gives you an opportunity. Um, it might not maybe considering what I just said earlier about being structured and, and traditional uh, society, it might not be as, as, as well respected here maybe as it should be, I don't know. Uh, or it might be that it is well respected or well 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 looked at. Um, 
but in a more kind of traditionalist way where the links are kind of stronger and you know what's happening and and you know it's kind of clear the game is the game is clear mm -hmm. um one thing that uh, maybe i mean having worked as a researcher in academia um, the most productive time of your daily uh, activities or of your work life is not when you're sitting in, in your office or when you're sitting in your laboratory. Mm -hmm. The most productive time is when the, the work hours are finished and you, you walk through the corridor, knock on everybody doors and just say, all right, guys, who wants to go for a beer? <laughs> uh, there are several reasons for that. One is, I mean, yeah. obviously, you, you sit down together, you talk, you chat, you relax. Um, so your brain kind of looks at things in, from different perspective you have chance to reflect on what 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 was happening that day and you have a chance to to com communicate with people who have different experiences mm. um, and you know just by sitting talking sharing experiences people give ideas to each other yeah um, you can call it if you want to like use the proper word you can call it benchmarking if you like um but it's definitely more beneficial than basically sitting in a corner of your lab or an office and 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 and, and trying to find a solution to the problem of course i'm talking from the perspective of, of, of from scientific perspective right? you know it's a lot more you are you are often searching for solutions for things that nobody has ever even thought of so mm you have to have the exchange of ideas and it's not about networking with people who think the way you think it's about networking with people who are totally different from, mm. from from what you are like it helps not i mean of course it helps to have you know four eyes are better than two in one room but um it helps a lot more if that other pair of eyes is 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 from somebody who is totally different from you if you're looking for scientific solutions but then it's the same even if it's not scientific yeah. even if it's just looking for solutions in general and how about today uh, omar since you know most of the people are working from home and or everything is online so how do you keep in touch with your colleagues my job has not changed a lot it has changed of course uh but if i compare the changes to my daily activities with the changes of daily activities of some of my colleagues uh, my change was not that big mm -hmm. having to work with uh, lots of external partners basically means that we spend lots of time on, on online anyway talking just the way you and i are talking now um what has definitely changed is travel so normally normal situations i'll be um, traveling at least minimum bare minimum is for two or three times a month mm -hmm. um, so in a way for me it became a little bit easier because you don't spend all this time traveling you can you can focus more on work or private life um, so you tend to i mean the things haven't changed that much you still tend to spend time online the way you did, you, you did before um the difficult part is with the lockdown and mm -hmm. you know, people are not able to you know you lose this face to face in a work environment in my daily business yeah. here um especially if you work with uh, in engineering where you know you, you have to deal with bits of hardware bits of software it's a lot easier to actually talk to each other when you're sitting in the same mm -hmm. room so that is something is lost and then you know, if you're sitting in a, in a conference room with 10, 20 people and you can see each other, I mean, you're losing the body language, basically. Yep. Not being able to see you know, what the reaction of the others is. Um, it's, it's not always easy. You're losing quite a lot of, of, of communication. Um, I don't know, I mean, people who have had... Um, there are customers from certain countries um, where non-verbal communication means a lot more than verbal. If you lose this uh, ability to see each other, 
and you're trying to present something and then you mm. try to figure out what the customer reaction is but maybe you don't see any of them or you just see video from one mm. it's not you, you lose a lot yep. that's, that's, but generally you, you yeah. find your way you know it's been a year unfortunately you find your way to to to, to deal with it like anything else i mean you basically have to adapt you have to evolve the situation is the way it is. You have to accept it. Mm. Um, the worst thing you can do is just keep complaining about it. Yeah. Because you're That's not going to change anything. You're just going to make your life more miserable and, and the life of people around you more negative. So basically, you just have to get on with it. Mm. That's true, Omar. It's been a year, you said. So, so far, we should be yeah. able to find different ways. Um, Omar, before we close, I would like to ask uh, you, what are you reading at the moment or what can you recommend our viewers to read? Oh, um, I have a pile of about 30, 40 books, which I would like to read and never get to it. Um, a good one that I have recently started and I haven't completed it yet is by the guy called Chris Woss. Mm -hmm. of Foss, I suppose, originally, but he's American, so I suppose it's a European surname, but um, it's V-O-S-S, I believe. Um, uh -huh. And he is a former FBI uh, negotiator. Uh, it looks like you might have heard of him. Yes. Um, yes, of course. So, uh, and he's basically advising people on how to not just communicate, but how to resolve the conflict. I mean, he's his uh his his focus is on negotiation but mm -hmm. i think that's just the kind of selling point and and the kind of focal point but i think through this kind of advice to others how to deal with it i mm -hmm. think he's more focusing really on communication in general and just negotiation is just kind of final milestone um he's very good in a sense that um and it's not just about the book. And the book is called, um, ah, I'm trying to figure, remember the name now. Uh, Never Split the Difference is the name of the book. Um, and I think this is an older version. I think he's, he's probably published mm -hmm. a couple of books since. Um, but you can also find lots of lots of YouTube videos and all sorts of other things mm -hmm. from him. Um, but it's about trying to find a solution. And, and, you know, I work in an environment where it's not about a negotiation. It's about finding a common solution that yeah. everybody's happy with as i mentioned sometimes at the beginning you know if you have a bunch of people who have to work together and they have to get another project after the current project and then another one and another one it's all about sustainability it's all about how can you maintain this this this, this progress how can you maintain the cooperation and you know everybody has to be happy if mm -hmm. you can't reach consensus um you know you're going to it's going to the situation is going to turn against somebody sooner or later and then the cooperation will stop so it's about finding the best possible solution for everybody and i think uh what what, what what's kind of what this book describes and and, and the kind of advice and, and training material that he provides is about really trying to find uh, not really negotiating but really trying to find the, the common solution that mm. everybody's happy with and it helps it helps in a daily life uh, it helps in work i may not tell my wife that i'm reading it because maybe she'll know tricks i'm trying to use uh, but yeah maybe once i studied it properly maybe i give it to her as well and recommend it to her as well let's see in our family my husband was the first one who read it and he told you about it <laughs> such a mistake he could have won every argument such a mistake. He's an engineer, Omar. Yeah, you know, honesty. <laughs> honesty is the. <laughs> you should not sharing be sharing the knowledge, no. being open-minded, finding solutions. You know. This is um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I thought about this recently, or quite recently, about this. You know, sharing knowledge, finding solutions. You know, trying, trying, trying to make success out of things, and I'm not talking now about politics or you know economics or whatever. But in a way, it's a kind of um, kind of let, let's put it this way: uh, it, it's a kind of communist or socialist view of the things versus capitalist view of the things. 
So especially if you work in a, in a, in a consortia like I do, mm -hmm. you have to have, a, you have to take a view that, that uh, kind of takes everybody in consideration. And you want to, you, you would like to have a, you would like to have everybody happy. Mm. So if you think about that as a kind of uh, ideological kind of basis for communism, uh, I'm not talking about politics or economics or yeah. anything like else. I'm just simply talking about, uh, you know, about keeping everybody happy. Then you can have some kind of sustainable, sustainable progress. Mm. If you take more kind of, uh, let's call it capitalist view, where it's just about like, you know, let's make money quickly and let, let's get on, let's get quick results. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way, yeah. but if you think about it in that kind of way, okay, let's just try to, to, to do it quick. Let's get to yeah. the next milestone and then think of the next step. You can be quite successful, but not for very long. Yeah. And that also gets into maybe your question of networking. You know, mm. um, do you want your network to be sustainable or would yep. you like it to, to you know just yep. kind of be temporary mm. just get in take what fits you best and and you know leave um mm. sorry that became a little bit more serious than probably your question was <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's really good i enjoy this omar it, it reminds me of this book of uh i don't know of simon sinek uh, the finite game and the infinite game. So the way, yes, you know, how you yeah. perceive things. Are you there for a long term or you're there just, you know, to uh, do whatever it needs to be done, mm -hmm. no matter consequences. Um, yeah, you know, there's plenty of examples and I can really recommend that book where he gives, you know, uh, uh, you know, use cases and company names that really, you know, did really bad, bad things because they could, they just, use the position that where they were like some of the pharmaceutical companies and some of them we did as well during our MBA where they just saw the opportunity to you know increase their prices uh, I don't know 300 500 percent because they just found uh, the loophole and that meant for the people who are buying that that they're not paying 20 euros they're paying 600 euros and it left them miserable so I yeah I like one. him. I like him. I like him a lot. I mean, I yeah. try to kind of, you know, when you are doing something and occasionally some video yeah. pops up from somewhere, uh, but especially this, this, yeah, as you mentioned, this, this idea of finite and infinite game. Yeah. Um, he, he can be quite a good inspiration quite yeah. often. And I, another thing I liked about him is uh, there's one of the videos or actually I like quite a lot of, the, of his stuff, but um uh, there is one of the videos uh, where he talks about, um, you know, accepting who your customers are, mm -hmm. and working, wanting or working for basically whoever comes and pays you. And, you know, he says, you know, I can't remember exactly the, the details because it's been a long time since I've seen this, but I think the interview asked him, you know, it's easy for you to talk about it now because, you know, you yeah. have lots of money now, yeah. you're famous and whatever else not. And he says, no, that's how I was even when I had nothing. Um, mm. um, so, you know, keeping your integrity and, 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 and which again goes back to your question of networking, you know, yeah. um, keeping integrity and thinking about sustainability of, of, of what you are doing is, is a lot more important because on a short term, in the short term, yeah, maybe sometimes you can ask yourself, what's the benefit of this? Why, why on earth am I doing this? Mm. But if you play a long-term game, um, if you don't have a, a final deadline for whatever you're doing, mm. um, then you're definitely going to benefit. I can, I can give you zillions of, of, of examples, like the, the stuff that I have done here in my current position, some things even not so long ago, um, you know, you try to protect a partner or collaborating party or whatever, and sometimes you even do it uh, slightly, you know, not against your own interest, but, you know, you, you bend the rules a little bit to help somebody else for the benefit of, of, of kind of project of the common good. And, you know, colleagues might not necessarily agree or appreciate, mm -hmm. uh, but then when you know, the, the, the situation is reversed and you're getting this favor back. Yeah. Um, 
then some of them realize it and then maybe change their opinion. Some of them maybe don't necessarily want to admit it. Um, but they're also the ones who say, look, that's not how I operate. I mm. like to operate with my own rules and I don't want to bend anything to keep somebody else happy. And it's okay. Everybody's different. I mean, that's what's, that's also what's nice when you work in a, in a kind of this innovative environment, everybody's different and everybody works in their own way and, and, and everybody brings their own benefits in their own different way. And you can split projects, you can split collaborations in a way that everybody works in an in environment that they are most productive in. Sorry. That's cool stuff, that was a little bit too long. You no. probably want to cut it down. No, no, we, we will leave it as it is. There is no cut, no makeup. It's a real talk with real people. Uh, and I really appreciate what, what you said because uh, everybody is different. And we all, uh, you know, especially if we work in an international environment for people who are moving to Austria. So, for instance, coming from a different continent, there is going to be. Uh, uh, adaptation and uh, there will be lots of maybe shocks and so on but as you said we keep evolving we keep adapting we keep creating we are, we are human so we we adapt to anything basically uh, do you only maybe advice for vegetarians coming to Austria it's not a very vegetarian friendly country so be prepared to make some concessions maybe that's uh, replying to one of your earlier questions yeah um, yeah. yeah what what could be uh, or plant your own garden you know it's it's also uh, an option uh thank you omar for being our guest uh for for sharing your few um insights and i really really enjoyed this conversation and i hope that our viewers will see the same uh, i will link your contacts uh your linkedin profile in the comment section on our youtube channel so people can connect with you if they have some kind of questions or maybe they're they would like to move to graz uh because it's a really nice place uh, it is well. a very nice place it it's is a beautiful very nice. place and um, thank you all for watching uh if you like um these videos subscribe to the channel uh comment share like uh, and if you have someone that would be a great um, addition as a guest to our channel, please let me know. Send me a, a LinkedIn message and I'm happy to host them on our channel. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. Right. Have fun. Enjoy the day. <laughs> you too. I'll talk to you soon. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Cheers. Bye.